This year marks my 30th year as a police officer. And it's odd because putting this talk together, I've come to realise for the last 25 years I probably didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> a few years ago, I took over one of the, Australia's largest police stations at a time when the police were in crisis. Images of police arresting an elderly homeless man were all over YouTube. Complaints about excessive use of force and injuries in custody were common. Our relationship with the community, in particular young people, was quite damaged. The police themselves told me they felt like they were under siege. Now, I'd come from a tactical background. I'd had a reputation for running these big policing operations where the success was usually measured by the number of arrests and how many people you locked up. I think there was part of me that truly believed if you just arrested, arrested enough people, you could, solve, you could solve most problems, if you just worked hard enough. But what very few people knew about me was that I'd applied to join the police at a time when I was just one step away from long-term homelessness. I'd been in the army for a short while and I'd found myself sleeping in parks, sleeping on couches, sleeping in a car underneath a friend's house until I saved enough for a little one-bedroom flat and I had no furniture and I was sleeping on the floor. Um, when I applied to join the police and I went to the academy, it was like winning the lotto, it was like paradise. So now, years later, this little policeman in charge of the biggest police station in Australia, um, I was asked to report about crime and our performance in terms of crime, how many houses have been broken into, how many cars have been stolen, how many crooks have we locked up. But the police on the street were telling me their concerns were quite different. They were concerned that they had nothing to offer a homeless man other than a night in the watch house. Some people were even paying for accommodation out of their own pocket just to give people one night off the street. They were very worried about recently built project housing that was turning into an urban slum before their eyes with high levels of violence and domestic violence. So after a few months I went to my boss and I said, I've got it, our strategies all have to be focused around supporting and helping vulnerable people, particularly the homeless, and probably arresting less people. Oh, well. You can imagine what sort of looks I got. So that's not your problem, you know. There are people that do that, and I agree there are. And you have to focus on the crime, and I agreed wholeheartedly. But I was very lucky. I had some very good leadership who trusted me, and they supported what we did next. We started some very successful police initiatives that were based around these ideas. We stabilised the project housing by asking police to be more personal and responsible to the people who live there. I asked them to adopt a building, get to know everyone that is in that building, not when they called us late at night when there was a drama, but before things happened, to refer people for help. What a unique idea, police helping people. <laughs> and you know what? The calls stopped coming. By this time, police were looking at me like, aren't you the tactical guy? Aren't you that, you know, taking care of business guy? As if I was speaking a different language, as if they expected a different response. So. The homeless issue had not gone away either, and in the middle of town, right across from the mall post, there was a man that exemplified this, a man called Doug. Um, I went down to the mall post one day and I said, what's the go with Doug, who knows him? And everyone said, oh yeah, we know Doug, he lives over there. He'd been there for 11 years, right across the road from our police station. So I said, well, what do you know about Doug? And it turns out no one could tell me who his family was or where he slept at night or what his medical conditions were, because he was quite unwell. So I went over and I sat next to Doug and police had obviously not done this before because Doug recoiled. He, he moved away from me and he said, oh, am I going to be arrested or am I going to get moved on? I said, no, mate, I just wanted to come and say hello. <laughs> obviously it didn't happen very often. So we had a pretty good conversation, especially for the first time a uniformed police officer had sat next to a homeless person like Doug in the city. And at the end of it, I gave him my business card and I said, Doug, do me a favour. When the police talk to you, tell them that you're my uncle and we'll see what happens. And now, Doug, Doug smiled, he was pretty switched on, he knew, what, he, he, I think he knew what was going to happen next. But Doug never got such good service from the local police. <laughs> he, uh, he had police checking in on him every day and the street to home team from Micro Projects was coming down and looking after him and the police would come to me and say, oh boss, I didn't know that fellow was your uncle. <laughs> uh, I have a very big family, I did extend, I do have a lot of uncles now. Um, they offered him help, they treated him differently and I knew I was onto something. Now, I'm a good nephew, but I don't have that many uncles and aunties, but there's got to be something in treating people like family. So I asked the police to sit down next to people to ask them things that would help us if they were in trouble. Where do, they keep, where do you keep your stuff in case we need to get it if you have to go to hospital? Who do we call if something happens to you? Where is your family? Is there something we could do? 
And I really knew I'd cracked it when a young constable came to me with his application to become a detective and he said, um, this is my best example. And it was uh, an example of when he connected with a 63-year-old homeless man in the gardens. He'd been there for 15 years uh, and he found he had family interstate. And on his own time, in between his normal work, he organised for this family to come up and this man to meet them and he went with his family who lives in a caravan in the backyard with those people. Now, there was a time when this wouldn't have been considered real police work, because we're probably not out there arresting people, but we all know it's excellent police work. That man's not going to be a victim of crime. That man's going to live longer because he's with his family, not to mention the time and money and effort that was spent with emergency services and police talking to that man and virtually sustaining him being homeless in the park. Now, that police officer went on to be an excellent detective who works with young people at risk. And it was that change in him that I saw as the opportunity for us. It was what I wanted to inspire in everyone else in the frontline policing at City. So he developed all these opportunities, all these other ways we could get police to talk to people when they weren't in crisis, to get to talk to people before there was a drama later on at night. I said, offer people help every time you talk to people. More, talk to more people. Even when you're arresting people, offer help. I said, if you offer help three times and then you've got to arrest someone, people will understand, the community will understand. And you know what? People might take that help, and that's what they did. So I got police to actually work with people that weren't police. I got them to work with youth workers and talk to young people around culture and community of origin, acknowledging their culture and where they're from. I issued police with free travel vouchers so that if they found someone who they knew was going to be trouble, they could give them a ticket to get out of town free. Very hard to be a nasty police officer when you're giving someone a free ticket. It's a real, to totally different conversation. I even got, it's my favourite piece of art, I even got some of the local street kids, some of the kids that we had run-ins with and had difficult relationships with, to create a piece of art that represented for them what the relationship with police should look like to them. And it was a very insightful, show some respect. And then I got the police to put this up in our station. And you know how police feel about graffiti, so that was pretty big. <laughs> but this, uh, was, it was a hard sell. Now, I saw the results and the benefits for this far outside the initial things we were doing, far outside those little activities, because every time police went to a job, even a different type of job, they were asking different questions. They weren't just saying, what ticket can I write or what arrest can I make? They weren't just saying, what report can I do so I can get out of here and go and get a coffee? They were saying, what's going on? What's the problem here? Why is this happening again to you? Why are we here again at the same place? What can I do? to help you make this not happen again? What can I help you? How can I help you make, make you feel better about what's happened to you? It's quite a unique thing for police to experience themselves. Sick leave went down. Police got healthier, probably even happier, I'd suggest. My station became the number one preference for police in their first year. They all wanted to come back and stay at my station. Now, no point did I tell police to stop arresting people and this represents all the time and effort we spent previously in getting people to move on and the conflict that was caused. We arrested so many people for disobeying move-on directions. We're still telling people to move on. Maybe they get a free ticket to help them, but we stopped fighting them. And people started doing what we asked to do because they understood and appreciated the reasons and how we were doing it. That not only represented a massive shift in the conflict and the time and the saving and effort, but what a shift in the police culture to still be able to do that. Thank the heavens the crime came down because I'd made a couple of big promises to people that were leaning on me. And crime came down 59% in property crime broken in us, 41% reduction in robberies, a 34% reduction in assaults, and a 50% reduction in complaints against police for use of force and excessive use of force in the first couple of years alone. And when my bosses said to me, so um, what are your crime strategies and what are you doing? It's going really well. I said, in all sincerity, we started helping people, particularly homeless and vulnerable people, and referring them to services that now trusted us. And we stopped arresting people. At least we probably started arresting the right people. It's my favourite graph, because it's TEDx. You love a graph, TEDx. <laughs> it makes you look like you know what you're doing. 130 police, people like me, and I'm one of them, um, were assaulted the first year in the city. Last year, 35 police were assaulted. Now, it's a pretty good measure of your business and how you're going if less people actually want to do you harm. <laughs> now, you probably won't see a TV cop show about police engaging 
People like Doug or homeless people in the street because it's not very sexy. You probably won't see an episode of Cops about police working in project housing and helping people, you know, in bad times reconnect with their community and be supported. But I'm telling you, that's where the magic of our police work happens every day. The problem had been we'd let other people tell us what our business was. We'd let the front page of the newspaper and mainstream media tell us what police work was and we'd, we'd fall for it. Even my kids still ask me, hey, Dad, how many bad guys did you arrest today? And they continue to be disappointed at my response. Um, one even said to me the other day, are you still in the police anymore, Dad? I said, yes, he, even he understands now. There's more to our job than the police than just arresting people. So I suppose my point is, and the challenge is, you know, if we can make empathy one of the most effective tools in fighting crime, particularly in an organisation where the impression and the expectation might be we're more interested in arrests and tickets and kicking ass and taking names, then what else can we solve with empathy? I've got no doubt that people that have the opportunity to put their empathy into action become better people and they do better business. People that experience their own little empathy epiphany, they don't have a choice, they become better people as a result. Now, um, my own little empathy epiphany hit me a bit like a truck. I was dealing with a particular young homeless guy who'd been in the army like me, and um, I looked at him and I thought, wow, my life could have been very different. So, with that in mind, it's very hard to argue with the interconnected nature of human contact and the, the basic belief that we're all equal in principle, and if not, we're we should be partly responsible for each other. Thank you.